Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mindy Hunthrop, and I am a program coordinator and academic advisor for the Master of Science in Operations Management program here at the University of Arkansas, and we are so glad that you've decided to spend your lunch break with us today. Just want to let you know that this presentation is brought to you by the Master of Science in Engineering, Engineering Management, and Operations Management programs at the University of Arkansas in the Industrial Engineering Department. So to get things started, first I will introduce our presenter for today, and today's webinar is brought to you uh, courtesy of Kirk Michelson. Kirk is a retired Navy Surface Warfare Officer, Government Acquisition Analyst, and Lockheed Martin Fellow, who now owns his own consulting company. He served as President of the National Military Operations Research Society and is a current Fellow of that organization. He also received their Lifetime Achievement Award as an Operations Research Analyst Practitioner. Some of his major analytical projects included determining the Navy ship force structure for the first quadrennial defense review and also developing Lockheed Martin's experimentation process with analytical rigor and incorporating analysis into the government and industry affordability efforts. So Kirk has been an instructor for the MSOM, the Operations Management Graduate Program, since August of 2015 and he also teaches classes such as decision support tools for operations managers, decision models and analysis, economic decision making and project management and then he will also be teaching uh, some other courses moving forward some other new developed courses so with that I will turn it over to Kirk and let him take it from here Kirk are you there thanks Minnie just to ensure you can hear me right <laughs> yes I can we okay can, we can hear you okay so you have to brief your senior leaders and decision makers what do you do what do decision makers like how do you develop the presentation? What should be included? What are some good and bad examples of slides you should use? This brief will hopefully help you answer some of those questions. But first, I need to give some acknowledgments. We had quite a, a group that put this, uh, the foundation for this brief together. It includes some text and course material from our decision models course in the Master of Science of Operations Management program includes other material from decision analysis projects from our Master of Science of Operations Management program professors, and contains material from briefings from the Military Operations Research Society or more. And in some of my verbal comments, I'm adding in some lessons learned from my five years briefing admirals and generals in the Pentagon. A little motivation, and we can't bring it up in the Blackboard Collaborate uh, medium, but if you get a chance, copy down this website, do a search on YouTube for Life After Death by PowerPoint. And this one I was going to show is about four or five minutes long from Don McMillan. And it shows just basically in a very humorous way how people are abusing their presentations and abusing, abusing the capabilities of PowerPoint. So if you get a chance, take a look at that. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about understanding decision-making and decision-makers, working with the decision-making team to help develop the presentation, the do's and don'ts in making your presentation slides, and then we're going to go ahead and wrap it all up. So let's talk about decision-making. Those of us that put together briefs, we understand the research, we understand the, rash, the uh, analysis associated. So we've got the area, the circle you see there for rational and analytical down. We may not know the direction the decision maker is getting from the political side of the house, his organization, or even the emotional side of the house. So hopefully, with some of the things we're going to be uh, working with you, what I'm going to be presenting today, is working with the decision makers' teams to hit that target so we can cover all three of those areas when we brief the decision maker. So let's talk about the decision maker first. We know they're busy and they have a senior staffer that is a gatekeeper to control access. We need to work with those gatekeepers to get on their schedules. By understanding and meeting with the decision maker, we can establish a vision and strategic objectives to present to the decision maker to know how our plan fits with their agenda, showing their objectives are valuable. Sometimes it's good to know who the decision maker's analysis champion is. The first brief them to get the insights of the decision maker before briefing the actual decision maker. We believe there's three minimum times when decision makers should be briefed. 
initially when you're discussing potential new analyses, then when you come back to obtain approval for your analysis plan, and finally provide the results briefing that you've put together to give them enough insight to make a decision. As I have in the red box there, uh, getting access to senior leaders early in the analysis and at key de decision points is very key. We know that getting approval of the project can be tough. We gotta go ahead and define the problem. What are they really looking for? What is their, the decision makers desired product at the end? What's the need date? How much time do we have? Are there any constraints? What are the resources? And here's a story I've heard when I was in the Pentagon, and I won't say it won't happen to me, but the decision maker says, I want a rock. Yes, sir. What type of rock do you want? Show me a rock and I'll tell you if it's right. So I showed him a rock. No, that wasn't right. I showed him another rock that wasn't right. Sometimes they don't know what they want. You got to work with them and their team to kind of peel back the onion and ask questions. We're going to show you how uh, to do that and uh, some recommendations for that in just a moment. But in analysis, we have an hypothesis testing, type one and type two errors. And we kind of humorly, a uh, mentor of mine uh, came up with a type three error. That's when you do all this fantastic work to solve the completely wrong problem. So that's a key point of the step is to describe the problem or find out what that problem is. So let's go ahead and figure out how we can do that by working with the decision maker and the decision making team. The first meeting, as you can see here with the Stephen Covey's quote at the bottom, beginning with the end in mind does not mean, uh, and that doesn't mean that you are working to prove an answer you want. You wouldn't believe how many times the senior leadership at least for the Navy side of the house, came to me and says, Kirk, this is your answer. I usually said, yes, sir, aye, aye, sir. Let it go in one ear and out the other. Bottom line, you are working to generate a set of feasible solutions and then design your presentation to best represent the information and recommendations based on your research and analysis. When developing the brief, you are the independent broker. In both my office, working for the Chief of Naval Operations and the Secretary of Defense, we like to consider ourselves the honest broker. We try to have the facts present themselves in a way that the audience sees the answer for themselves. So let's look at these slides, some of these bullets. We already talked about a well-defined problem because we want to make sure we're doing the work on the right problem. But the problem could affect others. So who are the other stakeholders? We need to meet with them and see their concerns. What are the constraints, limitations, maybe the budget, a certain resource amount we have to work with? Is there a clear why a decision needs to be made? You may or may not know that. It depends on when I found out in the Pentagon they played a lot. I got a secret. They wouldn't tell you a lot of the information. You had to keep working them, building a relationship with them to get more information. Is do nothing a feasible solution? Keeping the status quo, keeping what you want? Yes, more time and knots it is, but you need to ask. Do you have three months or three years? What is the timeline associated with the decision? And finally, the last bullet here, do you have known opposing views on the decision team? I'm gonna talk about that in a couple slides. So here's some questions to consider while preparing the brief. Have you ever reviewed the lessons learned as part of your research effort? Was there a project or something ahead that you could go ahead and see what was done and what may we could do better the next time through, or can you talk to your analysis champion to learn some lessons from previous briefers for that decision maker? So you'd rather have learned them than have to relearn them as you're going through your project. What can you logically assume without assuming away your problem and avoid major criticism? Do you have all your stakeholders agreeing with your assumptions? Uh, going down the list of trade, trade-offs that need to be considered. What solutions are sensitive where you may have to do sensitive analysis, uh, sensitivity analysis? Last bullet, what tools are essential and available for your analysis? Great quote for us analysts and modelers from George E.B. Box below. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. If we're developing a model, we want to make sure it's right for there. We know they're all wrong, but we want to make sure it's worthwhile for the effort that we're doing. Now I want to uh, kind of go through as we're talking about presentations working with the decision-making team is uh, uh, an example that I'm going to show how it relates to making precision. 
This is from our decision models course here in the operations management and engineering management curriculum, the coal chute. This individual, when he was growing up, uh, he always used to visit his grandparents' home. It was gorgeous, lots of great times to remember. They went off to college, they went off to work, and after several years later, uh, they inherited this place. Went back to take a look at it, and it had fallen in disrepair. Uh, all the windows and doors were shut. He wanted to get in there and take a look at it, and the only thing he could find was the dirty, dusty coal chute, like you see in the upper picture. So he entered the home there, but he was covered with coal suit all through. He spent a year fixing the home, got a nice, gorgeous double door that opened up to a lovely spiral staircase and a gorgeous sand chandelier above it. What a great way to bring visitors in. But did he bring visitors in there? No, he brought them in through the coal suit. Why? He wanted to impress them with his incredible diligence and hard work. Who does that sound like? Well, speaking for myself, it sounds like the analyst. I want to show all the detailed analysis of the decision maker. As we find out, decision makers are busy and they don't have time to sit through. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to take the decision maker down through the coal chute. And I'll mention that a couple of times today. You want to bring them in through the front door. And we have a couple of examples how you can do that with a bottom line up front slide and a process chart. So what do you want to do when you're briefing the decision maker? Well, if you had or have questions, then so would your audience. You want to anticipate them, resolve them, and put them to rest. Convince your audience, especially your decision maker, that they would have used the same logic you used. Critical to be sure audience doesn't lose your logic or invalidate the beginning of your story. This is an important step and should not be rushed or skipped over. Another foot stomping point from this presentation, you want to keep it simple, clear, and rational and always be succinct. So let's look at these. As you're developing your story, why are we here? Why is it relevant? Describing the problem. Decision makers are, are, are busy. You need to kind of remind them why you were tasked to do this problem. What's not part of the problem? Show the logic so they see the rational decision on their own, and then they can gain, you can gain acceptance of your logic or solution and strategy. Create visuals that are impactful and then know the risk and anticipate reactions. Albert Einstein quote couldn't be better for here. If you can't explain it simply, remember our, my point I wanted to say, I'm gonna repeat quite a bit through this brief, keep it simple, clear, and rational. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Here are some proven uh, presentation guidelines from the individuals that put this together when I've seen in my time in the Pentagon. Allow the decision maker time to talk. Once in your meeting, let them determine how long you stay. They may be interested in your subject, want to talk more. Sometimes it depends on where you're at, what stage and one meet, meeting you are with, with the decision maker, those minimum of three I mentioned. But you might want to just sit and listen so you can understand more what they're thinking about it. Next major bullet, use fewer and better slides. You can see some best practices here. Um, I know that was kind of both when I was uh, in the uh, analysis divisions for the uh, Chief of Naval Operations and Secretary Dev, we, uh, we kind of did 10 to 15 slides for 30 minutes, but that still could be too much. Sometimes the senior, le senior leaders and decision makers, and when you've given those briefs, get into huge discussions. I only had, when I briefed my admiral in the Pentagon, a one-page point paper and one to two slides to get my program across. Sometimes I'm only given 15 minutes. And I walked into briefings where I uh, was told I had an hour. Was, oh, uh, we're late. We didn't get started until 45 minutes late. You've got 15 minutes late. So that bottom line up front slide I mentioned before, and I'll talk about and show you some examples here in the future, was what saved me. So I could go to there and just hit a couple other slides. But when the senior leaders start to ask questions, listen to them. Listen to what they have to say. Wait until they are done before answering and answer succinctly. It's probably just a yes, no, or I'll get back with you. You don't want to engage in a long dialogue unless the decision maker is doing that. There's too many times I've seen the decision maker, who's not necessarily up to speed on the topic, provide some background before he even gets in the question, then boom, 
The briefer comes in and starts answering, interrupting, which is not the question the decision maker wants to answer. So give them a time to finish. Give them a time to answer the question. I've learned at my time that sometimes we only have time for executive summer briefs. And in preparing the briefs, when your analysis is done, like it says here, it's about 50% done. You've got to put it together to make it understandable to your audience. Do you have any pre-briefs? And then you have the one for the uh, decision maker. Some of us on, uh, as analysts has come up for the other 50%. We think it's 30% of the time to define the problem, to determine what rock that decision maker wants us to, to find out for them, 20% for the research analysis, and then still 50% to get in the right briefing for the audience to understand it. We talked about pre-briefing the analysis champion early in this brief. If you can pre-brief all the uh, analysis champions, the stakeholders, any advisors early to get their insights, that's better because you could incorporate them. Remember to keep the charge clear and concise. My foot stomping point. Do not include extra information. You do not want to include all your analysis. Again, you don't want to take them down through the uh, coal chute. Depending on the decision maker, advisors, stakeholders are at your briefing, you may include information in the backups in case particular questions come up. If I had a written report, I had tabs with it, like with my one-page point paper with certain Im background information, so if a question came up, it was available. When I'm giving a brief, if I had the 10 to 15 slides like I showed on a previous slide, I'd have some backup slides, then I'd make myself a list. Slide in the backup, slide 17 was this topic, slide 23 was this topic, so I knew exactly where to go so I wouldn't be searching and wasting time finding the slide to answer the decision maker or the other senior leaders questions. The goal is, like I mentioned earlier, is telling a story and providing insights so they can make a decision. As an analyst, I tend to like to tell everything I did. However, for decision makers, I learned this in the Pentagon early on in my career, since they don't have a lot of time, we need to develop and present executive summary presentations. Talked about pre-briefing key advisors, and that's your analysis champion and the other stakeholders. Then here's my favorite bullet. It's the one I referred to, I said I'd talk about later. Listen to views of known antagonists and pessimists in advance. Don't know how many of y'all think of this, but there's always that one or two individuals who argue with on your project, argue with everything you say, boast these results, which they don't have any facts behind to do them. I love to have them on my team, include them, so as I'm going through my project and doing my research, doing my analysis, I include them. I ask them questions. I get all their there so I can include it in my brief, include it in my back up, or at least I've already looked at it. So if I get that same question when I'm given the brief, I've already tackled it. And it usually takes care of about 80, 90 percent of any things that come in off the wall. But I always like to have that antagonist or pessimist on my team as I go forth. The second to last bullet there, don't hold on to bad news. Don't hold on to good news. You want to become that trusted agent. So if you know something, go back to them. In the Pentagon, I would go back to them and say, and I may learn more of their secret. It's, oh, maybe we should have told you to go see the stakeholder, or maybe we can adjust your analysis plan to include this step. And I never referred to it as final results. I always referred to it when I found my news and I wanted to give them good or bad, it was preliminary findings. And finally, give adequate time to educating others and getting their feedback. That's when you're pre-briefing all the stakeholders, the analysis champion. I tried to schedule mine about a couple weeks in advance, get some immediate feedback, and then give them a couple days for some, if they let the briefing absorb, to provide me some additional feedback. And then I would go ahead and update my brief as appropriate so I'd be more ready when I brief the decision maker. The bottom line, as you see in the red tagline box, the better you understand your audience and the better they understand you, the easier the process becomes in briefing that decision maker. When getting a decision, it, it can be tough. And so have the gaps of information due to time, funding, or stakeholder participation been accepted? Is there pressure for decision due to program synchronization, operational needs, personal needs, or opportunities lost? Does this sound like that 
political organizational circle I said that was part of the overall decision making. It's important that the presenter has built trust with the stakeholders, core decision making team, and the decision maker along the way. That's becoming that trusted agent like we talked about on a previous slide. Don't be surprised sometimes if the decision maker wants a combination of solutions. I've come away, presented a couple alternates, and decision makers say to me, hey, Kirk, I like this part of A, that part of B, that part of C. Can you put something together on that? So you might be able to consider ahead of time if you know by working with the decision makers team what they're thinking that kind of help think ahead. If not, maybe if you don't get a decision, you request a decision at that final meeting where you're providing the insights. But if you don't get a decision, maybe the decision maker will give you a few more weeks to go back and look at these alternatives. But also find out there who's going to implement the decision. You don't want to have to go and learn all the lessons that you had to. You want to make sure they're up to speed with everything you've learned with your analysis. Okay, so we've worked with the team. Uh, we, we've talked with the decision maker. We've worked with the team. Let's talk about that actual presentation so the decision maker can easily understand what you're trying to present to them. Start first with some visual information. The first bullet here. Clear, concise, concrete, correct, coherent, complete, courteous. Be clear, simple, succinct, kind of some of the points I've been stating all along. These are actually the seven C's of communicating that was published by mindtools.com, and they're very applicable to a briefing a decision maker. Is the information necessary? Remember I said about number slides, you may or may not need it. Can it go in the backups? Can it be just in your mind so if they ask a question? But if it is necessary, is it large enough? What room are you briefing in? Where is the projection screen? How big will the projection be? You might want to go take a look at the room ahead of time and see where you know, the decision maker is going to sit and where you're going to be briefing. Or if you're giving a lap brief when you got hard copies, is it large enough text that they can brief, uh, read it on the slides that you give? Uh, guide them to see it for itself. That's the, okay, let's tell a story. Let them come to your logic and get buy-in as you're going through. It's kind of the quote we see from Blaise Pascal in the tagline box below. People are generally better persuaded by the reasons which they themselves discovered. Another point here I want to bring up in visual is avoid communication. And uh, I can't build the slides in here, but if you look at that top part of the black box, that's pretty easy to read. The mind accepts that. Uh, yellow text for the word yellow, blue text for the blue uh, for uh, uh, for the blue word. But you look below, purple text for the word yellow, red text for the blue. That's kind of somewhat confusing to the mind. I know this is, uh, you know, a pretty obvious case where we wouldn't be doing this. But kind of as you're looking your sides, you want to avoid confusing the decision maker. You want them to understand your visuals when you go through. And once you get, uh, present the visual, go on. If you need to come back, you can. But remember, the uh, decision maker doesn't have a lot of time. So you don't want to spend a lot of time on any one slide, unless there's discussion, of course. Explaining charts. And just I should give you a definition here. It looks like a graph there. I call all my graphs charts. I teach, as you saw from this bio for me, I teach a course in Excel as a prerequisite for the operations management uh, program. And Excel, Microsoft calls all graphs charts. And in some of my analysis and just what I've been done over the years, so I call it charts. So if I say charts, I'm talking a graph if that, if that may be the word that you're used to. But explaining charts. If you've done all the work or your, one of your teammates have done all the work, and they put together a slide, they're going to probably answer 90, 95, 98%, maybe 100% of the questions asked by the, the audience in the brief. If you pull something from the web, hey, this looks great, this matches in there, but can you explain it? You don't just want to pull, pull it because it looks good. Like in this particular slide, you take a look at it. Can you explain quintile quickly? I know as an analyst, I use quartiles quite a bit in analysis, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. I don't use quintiles. So I'm assuming it's 20%, you know, quint, five. Uh, and 
that may be easily understandable, but if you go to the next question, how do you explain why the income levels are not equally grouped? The first, uh, the poorest quintile at the beginning is from zero to $33,000. So it's a range of 33,000. The next one, uh, the next poorest is from 33,000 to 42,000. About 9,000 as you work across. The richest quintile is from about 65,000 to 246,000. Why are they different? If you don't know what the answer is, the recommendation is don't use it. You need to do, you may have to do a lot more research. And if there's an article with it that you can explain it, that you think you can answer all questions. So just be wary when you're using slides from the internet. Talking about scales and about color schemes over the next couple of slides. These are two slides here. It shows the US forces and contractors in Afghanistan and Iraq. The black columns are US forces and the gray columns our contractors. So you can see here if a decision maker is looking across the room, looking at these slides, eh, maybe Afghanistan, there's a few more US forces and contractors than there is in Iraq. But if you look closely, especially since I have the arrows there, uh, it's not the same scale. The Afghanistan is 100,000 and the Iraq 200,000. So by not having the same scale, so we're not confusing the mind, as we said in that visual communication slide. We are confusing the mind, so they, the decision maker may think they're similar, but they're really not. So you got to strive for the same scale when you're putting together your slides. Same color schemes. We had the same color screen on the last one with the gray and the black. Here, the decision maker, I mean, excuse me, the briefer could brief the decision maker that the blue columns are U.S. deaths. The red uh, columns are U.S. casualties. The orange columns are contractor deaths, and the green columns are contractor uh, wounded. So we've got the same color scheme in both. But what did we do long, wrong here for the Afghan casualties in the Iraq? The scales are not the same again. The Afghans only 6,000, where the Iraq is 8,000. So again, it's kind of like we're confusing the decision maker, especially like probably you can't read the numbers very closely here. The decision maker may not be able to read the numbers across the room very closely. So make sure you have the same scale. Now I want to move into the summer slides. Um, first of all, the bottom line up front or the bluff slide. It's to set the stage for the brief for the decision maker that you're given the brief. It could be to kind of go over the information, a quick summary up front, or it could be the results of your analysis. And we'll show a couple examples as we go through. The two slides that I have here are from a project industry worked across with several different professional societies to answer a question for the Secretary of Defense staff on mission engineering. What is industry state of practice in that area? and what can be our role of industry supporting uh, the government in it. And this first time we put it together, we had some bullet slides here uh, at the bottom. You can see the tagline at the bottom. This defense industry can be a, a key mission engineering partner to address the needs. That's our bottom line. But there were some concerns, and we kind of listed them up front. So as we went through them, the decision maker was uh, aware of them so we could talk in more detail when we got to the appropriate slides. Towards the end of the project, after we did this survey across industry through the professional organization, we kind of had a better idea. So in our final brief to the Secretary of Defense uh, staff that was a lead, we started out with their definition and the top, and then we worked together and said mission engineering from an industry perspective was three different things working together. The mission analysis from the operations analyst, the systems of system engineering, from the systems engineers, and the decision support from the decision analyst. That was mission engineering, and as you see, it's applicable all across the life cycle, basically what the tagline is. Again, bottom line up front, it kind of states where you're going, gives the decision maker and the senior leadership an idea of what they're going to be seeing in future slides. I don't know how I would have done without having bluff slides in my brief Pentagon and, and when I worked for Lockheed Martin because there's been time. It said I'm going in. I'm supposed to have 60 minutes. 
the one admiral, the key admiral, the decision maker was running late. I'm only getting 15. I got to start with the bluff slide and then I just had time for a couple more. But starting with that one, we got our point across right away. Another kind of summary slide that you can do in the beginning is what you call a process chart. And as you see in the tagline box at the bottom, the red box, the first line, a process chart is one that describes the systematic process that you went through in the project. And it can be the most important point or most important chart in the presentation. Why? It gives the decision maker and senior leaders confidence. You understand their problem, that you have a solid plan, and it also improves their understanding of your plan. I'm going to show a couple examples uh, and uh, uh, of a couple process charts. And this one here was presented to senior leaders of the Air Force. Our Master in Science of Ops Management and Engineering Management uh, and Engineering Program Director, Dr. Craig Parnell, and I think I saw he's logged in, so I got to be accurate on this. He worked a future project a few years ago with the Air Force on what technologies would be available for future operation. In this process chart, it shows the process with the operators in yellow on the left, i.e., determining the value model, their measures of merit for systems, and ranking the scores. And then the process the technologists went through in blue on the right, determine the technologies available, the critical technologies for the systems, and ranking the technology cores, uh, scores. So in this one chart, it tells a good story. It tells what was done for the project. Dr. Parnell told me that in his first brief to a three-star general, while he was briefing, he noticed the general pulled the slide out of the brief and referred to it throughout the brief. At the end of the brief, when they were done, the general stated this was the first time they understood the process as the brief was presented. So there's a very good pro for using a process chart right there. Another example of a process chart is here from the Department of Energy World on a spill. And what you have here is everything in one slide. You show the, uh, the source material, the documents that you use were start, the evaluation of alternatives, the weightings you went through to weight these alternatives, conducting decision analysis, and then working towards the summary slides that you see on the top and bottom on the right, the component value chart and the life cycle cost charts. I have an example of these coming up in the future, but, uh, but right there it tells everything in one slide. Good way to show an overview. But what you've got to find out, work with that analysis champion. Find out on your decision maker, do they like bluff charts? Do they like uh, process charts? Do they like both? So you got an idea ahead of time as you're developing your brief, and you can include that. And then when you're doing your pre-briefs, you'll get some insights on whether uh, you you might have forgotten a step or not. But anyway, these are good, so make sure you work with your analysis champion. Now I want to go through and talk about some bad slides and then work into how we can make them into better slides, good slides. First here, here's an example of a bottom line upfront slide. The multinational core requires riverine forces. The enemy has been employing along the Tigris River to move material. There have been 94 coalition casualties. Therefore, the core in Iraq requires three companies. Hmm. I don't know about decision makers, but that's three, excuse me, three bullets. And I'm kind of scratching my head. So I've had the tagline, a picture's worth a thousand words. How can we really set the stage, kind of like what the mission engineering team did when they add the pictorial, the second bottom line upside. Let's go see if we can do something here. And uh, this is what uh, the Army did in their course where we got a military ops research site he got from. They changed the title. Riverine forces required to meet threat on waterwise. They stated the bottom line up front. Enemy activity is centered along inland waterways. And you can see all the activity with the red and the blue stars uh, on the upper right. There's a lot of it. You can see a little white box with the white words Tigris River. You can see a lot of activity. And then around the, uh, uh, the river to the southwest of that, you can see there's more activity there. So, and then going with the bullets on the slide, all within one kilometer of inland waterway and resulting in 94 coalition, therefore three companies or riverine forces are needed. So it set the stage and now you can go through the analysis on why you need three companies there. But this will give the, uh, the visual 
information the decision maker needs to start the breed. Okay, let's go on to another example of good and bad. And let, before I go back to, to that, I wanna give one example here, real life example of this. When I was in the Pentagon, Mindy brief that I did, I was slated, I worked for the Secretary of Defense, I worked in uh, what's now the CAPE, it was PA and E back then on the Secretary of Defense staff, program analysis and evaluation. And I was slated being Naval Forces Division to do the analysis to how many ships we needed in the total Naval Force structure for the first Cordennial Re uh, Defense Review back in 1998. So the Navy has requirements for a certain amount of time to be present in theme, th uh, three major theaters, and then we have a requirement of how many ships are needed at their definition of war that was back in the late 90s. So what I did is I did the analysis and I showed a bunch of charts on a certain size four structures and how much presence would be there and then how long it would take to get the force to wartime to meet the requirements. The decision makers could see right up front all the analysis, they have all the insights to make a decision and they could see the risk. Went over very smoothly. I found out later that in OSD, my uh, counterparts in land in air forces did bullet charts, kind of like what you saw here with this ex bad example here. So I learned later that the senior leadership had to ask a lot of questions before they could get the answers to understand what I had done pictorially and making good visual presentations. So the advantage of doing pictorial presentations or bullets are, are phenomenal if you have the capability and the data to do so. Next, I wanna go into here and, and uh, look at this chart here where they were preparing or, or showing the decision maker and deployed forces, the number of casualties where red was civilian, uh, green is uh, U.S. forces, the blue is coalition forces, and the yellow lines on them are um, the amount of attacks. And these are what, what we call stack column charts. And it looks like all the cities are bad. Where do I start? But as you see with the bullet on the left, scales are inconsistent. If we look closely, it may be kind of hard to see, but city number one goes up to 160. City number five goes to 16. City number five looks worse than number nine, but it goes to 45. So here, we talked about same scales. We got the good color scheme, but we talked about, with, uh, but we talked about the same scales, and these are inconsistent, so we're not giving the decision maker a good visual picture. So if we go ahead and we work with it a little bit, and we get them all on the same scale, they're now consistent. So we can actually see it. A decision maker can make some decisions on the next step. Say, maybe I need to take a look at city one and three to start reducing the casualties there, then cities four and six. So you get a little better game plan if you give the, uh, uh, the decision maker the right visual to help them understand. Finally, I want to go into tables versus charts. And what I'm showing here was the results of in theater where they'd done a survey. And it was just answering a couple questions. How is security in your village? How safe do you feel while traveling from village to village? And how satisfied are you with your ability to use electric power? And they had a scale from zero to five to answer it. And they took all the results and then they just averaged them. So the brief into the decision makers, it says security is improving. Look at the green box. So the green box is three, eight, but less the briefer explains explains what wave is, which happens to be years, explain maybe the, uh, the decision maker is not an analyst, doesn't know mean is the average, or doesn't know SD is a standard deviation, deviation, which is the square of the variance. But you gotta look at these, and the, uh, the briefer will have to brief them in detail. Electrical power remains constant in the blue, you can go look it through, okay, how does that? Well, we gotta look at the means again, 3.0, 3.2, 2.8, .2 it does show it's constant, and wave four, the variance is higher, or in this case, the standard deviation, because that's square root of variance, because there was less data. So it's going to take the one, the briefer, a longer time to explain this to the decision maker, and it's going to take the decision maker a longer time to understand it. So maybe by making a line chart to kind of show trends, and here we have the scale zero to five, and we have the, for each year, which was the ways, 2010 through 2014, we got the means there. How is security in the village? We got them coded with red, 
and you can see over time the trend is going up, so the security is improving over time. How safe do you feel while traveling from village to village? It is going up, but what you also notice, pe people feel more safe because the security scores are in the village are higher than the scores going from village to village. And finally, just a note on the bullet, we don't have anything here for 2013 because there wasn't enough data. And you don't have to include the electrical. But here, visually, the decision maker can see that. So um, thanks to uh, another professor uh, in our operations man uh, management program, uh, Amy Rossetti, we were able to put together, she found some information on recommendations for tables versus charts when you're looking at your data. First, you ask yourself some questions. Does your audience need to look up specific values? Do they need to compare specific values? Do they need precise values? If so, then a table is used. However, if you have a slide filled with a data table, it may or may not be difficult to read. You need to go look at that room and see what it says. A suggestion would be to make your handout for your audience so they could read it better. But if you want to show trends, like we did with the survey results, or if you want to show comparisons, like we did with those cities in the casualties, then maybe a chart should be used. They may ask questions on the data, so you may want to have a handout available with that. But here's some just general for starting out on some recommendations between tables and charts. Colors, I said colors were great. Here we have one of those value component charts. You have all the values in descending order from the largest to the smallest, from all these alternatives, and this is from that DOE project uh, or process chart I showed that had this in the upper right hand corner of it. And on the bottom, we have our legend to show the key with all the different components up and make the components. And there's some other information on here for the people in the Department of Energy and that we're looking at this process uh, could use. But the first big question, you know, first good pro, colors can be good. The second part of that is, Maybe I should work with the analysis champion. Is my decision maker colorblind? If so, I might have to go to patterns or go to shading or something of that nature. Just make sure you know you've worked with your decision making team on what that is. Okay, I love this. This is from our decision models course, teaching decision analysis. This is a MODA spreadsheet, a multiple objectives decision analysis spreadsheet, and showing all the down in detailed analysis. It's got sensitivity analysis, it's got the final results, it's got everything. I love it, but if I do this, like I say in the title, I'm taking the decision maker through the coal chute. They don't have a lot of time. So let's talk about the summary slides. Here's that value component chart that we saw in the DOE spill, but different for here. This problem was where to place across the US, what state, a new data center. And the value here on the vertical scale goes from zero to 100, and this bar that goes all the way up to 100 is the ideal. Here are the different states, the alternatives, and these are the different components, metrics that make up. So a decision maker can look at that and see uh, which, which ones are different, like this uh, kind of light purplish is growth power. There's not a whole lot in these two alternatives, but there is here. So you can kind of take a look at what's causing the difference, what's causing the value. And if we put those values on a value versus cost chart, We've got a zero to 100 on the vertical scale, and then we've got the ideal up here at 100 and hopefully zero cost. And then we've got the life cycle cost here in millions of dollars. That's that dollar sign million. You can see a lot right here, and you can take a look and immediately say that Tennessee dominates all of these down here to the lower right. Why does it dominate? Is because Tennessee is lower cost, 400 million. All of these are to the right, so they're more cost. And it's higher in, in uh, uh, value than everybody. It's close to Texas, but Texas is about 200K more. The only difference is, is what about Washington State? The value is quite a bit higher and uh, from about 80 to about 50, but it's also twice the cost from about 400 to 800. So this is where you presented the insight to the decision maker to make a decision. You're not making the decision. Maybe you know, you've shown the analytical and rational part of the decision making circle we talked about, but now here, maybe there's something political organizational that would wanna choose Washington State. Bottom line is, you're showing the insights in good charts that a decision maker can visually see and make their decisions. Okay, I wanna end up this section here 
with some best practices on charts. And the bottom line is the best displays or charts are often the simplest. I've been saying I want to keep it simple, uh, uh, clear, and succinct in your briefing. On this slide, some formatting do's and don'ts. First, the titles, chart titles, and the access titles, meaningful. Your brief may travel. Sometimes if you have a lap copy, a hard copy, and the decision makers looking through it while you're showing the brief, they could look ahead and make sure your titles are understandable. Or if it gets passed around you, send it out for review. You want to make sure they're understandable. The access titles should also contain the units of measurement. And you saw that example that I did in the life cycle cost on the previous slide. Legends, if there's more than one series of data, you should include it. Um, You've seen it, it says here on the top, but it can go on the top, on the bottom. You just want to minimize the size of the legend so you can maximize the size of the chart and the division maker, no matter how far he is away from the chart, he or she is away from the chart, they can make a, I can see it clearly visually. Uh, color, uh, from all the things I've read, it naturally muted colors. And what I recommend is go checking out in the room you're going to breathe in to make sure when you project it, it doesn't do anything weird to your color or text. Scales, we talked about consistent scales, but not have numerous zeros. You saw the dollar sign millions in that life cycle cost that you didn't want for Tennessee 400, then plus six more zeros. Um, they should begin at zero with a few exceptions. The exception being is if you start your chart at zero and everything's in the upper right-hand corner of it, Maybe you want to have a breakout chart, an arrow to it, and just enlarge that area so you can show the differences. 3D. 3D looks cool, but sometimes the data is hidden. It tends to confuse decision makers, especially decision makers that may not understand a lot of analysis and charting and that. So keep with the 2D. And with your columns, which are up and down, or bars left and right, don't overlap them, because sometimes data is missing. So just some few comments as we, as we go through there. I'd like to go ahead and summarize with a couple slides here. Uh, is first, these are from mindtools.com again, and these are their avoiding 10 common presentation mistakes. If you uh, do a web search on that, you're going to get details behind it, but some of them are pretty obvious, not preparing enough. If you don't prepare enough, your decision maker is not going to have maybe the confidence that you did all the right analysis, or there may be some questions and concerns not familiarizing yourself with the venue equipment. I've mentioned that a couple times. I learned, so I didn't want to relearn that lesson. First brief I had didn't go over well. Boy, did I hear about that from my manager because the colors weren't there and the texts weren't there, so I went to the room and checked it out. Uh, two verbose, want to be succinct, like I said before, is part of one of the key points of this uh, briefing. And you want to use effective visuals. If you want to see all 10 of these and how they're used poorly, go check out that video on YouTube uh, that's a uh, view uh, death by PowerPoint and uh, by uh, uh, Macmillan. And I'll tell you what, you're going to see all of these used quite a bit. So let's kind of summarize what we talked about very quickly in this time. It's communicating with decision makers, get access early and often. The second major bullet, we had the three minimum times we recommend getting started, understand the decision makers problem, what rock are they going for, and making sure we understand it so we don't do a type three error by solving the completely wrong problem. A plan approval for the work plan, a systematic approach. Maybe this is when you show your first, um, uh, your first process chart. And like I said, when I was in the Pentagon, they tend to have a secret. They says, oh, maybe you need to add this step that you didn't tell me before, or maybe add this uh, stakeholder. And then finally, you wanna provide a decision briefing with enough insight, you're telling that story so they come to the same logic that you did and enough where they can uh, go ahead and make a decision from that. Going back to the uh, other bullets up at the top, uh, respecting their time, we know we don't have a lot, be ready to go shorten your brief if need to. In telling your story, remind them of the project, they're extremely busy, just have a short overview of what you're doing. Brief your work, your teammates can brief theirs, there's no problem with co-briefing. Sometimes it's kind of, if you're working with the decision maker team, put yourself in the decision maker's shoes. Maybe they can tell you a little bit about what, the, what goes through the decision maker's mind and make sure you can kind of state it that way when you put it in the brief. Rehearsing with someone who does not know your topic, that's great because there's been times that uh, I've done that and it says, hey, Kirk, I don't understand this. Well, sometimes 
the decision maker and the audience I'm briefing will understand it, but I may need to tweak it the way I save it so it doesn't come out confusing at all. And there's other times I know what I did from the analysis, but I didn't show how I led to that decision here, and I may have to update and, and change my brief a little bit. And don't forget when you're putting together these executive summary briefings, the one chart summary, the bottom line up front, and the pro or the process chart. Um, that ends it in a nutshell. I know that with the fire hose to you all, there's a lot of information to cover. Uh, Mindy's going to talk about questions, but here's my email if you want to go ahead and send anything to me uh, later. But Mindy, I'm going to turn it back to you to wrap up and how we're going to do questions. Great. Thanks, Kirk. Those are some really good tips that I think we can all use moving forward and in, in presenting to you know senior decision makers and, and everyone all over. So as we open it up for questions, if you will type any questions you have in the chat box, you should see the chat available in the bottom right kind of corner of the screen. So just click on the little chat box there and please type in any question that you have. And while, while you do that, I'll just tell you a little bit more about the programs I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So the Master of Science and Operations Management program you see on the screen, just a few kind of key points about that program. It is 10 graduate classes with the potential of four prerequisites. It's very affordable, so you can complete the entire degree for just under $15,000. Um, so that's really a good option for a lot of you, if you're interested or if you like what you heard today from Professor Kurt Michelson, we also have a graduate certificate in project management, which is just consists of four graduate classes. All of these classes can double count toward that uh, master's degree in operations management too, but if you're just looking to kind of brush up on project management, maybe prepare for that PMP exam, this is a really good opportunity for you as well. Um, and so again, if you have questions right now, please type them in the chat box and otherwise we'll kind of keep going through this. I know Kurt gave a great presentation. I don't see any questions now, but again, the, the, the floor is still open, the floor is still yours. While we kind of wait for that and allow you to formulate those questions, I will remind you that the next webinar will be Tuesday, September 25th, and it is gonna be presented by Travis McNeil, who's also an instructor for the Operations Management Program. And this one is going to be about leading through change and change management. Again, you'll also be able to view everything on our website, which is listed here. So after this presentation, a recording will be sent out, an email will be sent to everyone as soon as the recording is available and posted to our website. But again, I don't see any questions, so um, please do type them if you have any questions. Oh, we do have one here from Dave. We, we just have a comment, actually, that said, great examples and discussion. Thank you, Dave. Um, and if there are no questions, we will kind of wrap it up here. You should have both my email address, which is on the screen now, as well as Professor Michelson's. And it looks Perfect. like someone raised their hand. If you have a question, please type it. Um, Sean, if you please would just type your question in the chat box, we'd be happy to answer it. All right, Kirk, so do you see a question there? Do you see the question, Kirk? Yes. Uh, as long as you can understand and adequately explain, may use analysis and chart directly from SMEs and other analysts, not reinventing the wheel. If you can understand and explain it, if it fits into it, just make sure you give credit. You've seen like a, uh, uh, a, where I gave acknowledgement at the beginning of the brief because I've used some of the charts and that from our course. Just make sure you give credit for that. So, uh, yeah, that's okay, Sean. So, Greg, I guess I didn't screw up your example. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're just uh -huh. thanking or, or there. I don't see. Okay. Can you recommend sources for additional information regarding bluff charts? Uh, I don't have any offhand. Um, I don't know. Maybe because uh, I got a lot of the information from Greg. If you're still on, can I work with you to get some stuff? And Ed, make sure you send us an email so we can send you that information uh, ahead of time or, or ahead of time later. Yeah, and it looks like Greg did leave the session. Okay. He may not be able to, to pop in there. But yeah, those are, thank you, Ed and Sean. Those are great questions. 
Yeah, I've been through Travis. I've been through the cold suit too many times. I'm a geeky analyst, so I tend to like that, and I've had to learn that over my years. <laughs> and it looks like Dr. Oh. Parnell is here still, so he. And it looks like he may see Ed on Saturday. So, does that mean Greg that you'll answer his question on Saturday? <laughs> Yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, yeah, getting ready for that first football game of the year. Yes, against Hawaii. Sorry, I went to Navy. <laughs> yeah. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. If you do think of questions later or if you're interested in one of the degree program options that we are offering, uh, please feel free to email us. And yes, if, if Kirk would like to share his slides, which I think he's mentioned that he is fine with, we can also email those out. Absolutely, and I think, uh, yeah, I don't think I went over that. I think, Michael, you've been one of my students. Yeah, yeah but I'll, we'll make sure you get that. Uh, Mindy's got all the addresses. And All right, so with that, we will conclude. Well, we got one more, Mindy, oh, cool. um, from Larry. All right. Senior leaders like to read background info before the presentation, so be prepared to receive the info. Sometime the decision maker team will prepare our background information for them and pre-brief them. I know I did that for my admiral quite a bit. And so that's why it's very important for working with their decision makers team. So you're getting the information, keeping them with the good news and the uh, bad news. So they know what's going there. And usually their team will put something together for them and pre-brief them before the actual brief. At least that's what I saw when I was in the Pentagon. But sometimes you may be tasked to do that. If it is, just a quick background and overview of the tasking is there. But work closely with the analysis champion or their, the decision makers team. All right. It looks like I don't see any other questions popping in. Again, we'll be here for a few more minutes, so please feel free to type questions if you do have them and otherwise we will send an email um, within the next week with information about the video and as well as these slides here. So thanks again for spending your lunch break with us today and thank you Kirk, you gave a great presentation. That concludes today's session.